Hi everyone, I'm Kimberly Henderson, a partner with McKinsey's Sustainability Practice. I have the great pleasure of moderating our sessions today on achieving the green industrial revolution an exploration of innovative partnerships. We are facing major sustainability challenges right now, particularly related to climate change. Scientists estimate that limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees is needed to limit the risk of initiating the most dangerous and irreversible impacts of climate change. Now is a pivotal time in the fight against climate change. The 2020s are critical. The decisions made in the next few years will determine the path we're on for the future of the planet. And this of course coincides with the economic recovery from COVID-19. Now the good news is the investments we make in the low carbon transition can also create jobs and support economic recovery. Positive economic impact and positive environmental impact can go hand in hand. And it is still possible to get onto a 1.5 degree pathway. It is technically achievable, but we need to act very quickly. The math is daunting. Such a pathway would require dramatic emissions reductions over the next 10 years, starting now. In every part of the economy would need to decarbonize. Every industry would need to target net zero emissions. This includes industrial companies, which account for about a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions and about a quarter of our GDP and a quarter of our jobs. In industry, decarbonization is less straightforward than in many other sectors. Electrification will play a key role, uh, particularly for industries with low temperature heat requirements that can be easily electrified. But for industries with high temperature heat requirements or with process emissions, we need other solutions. For industries like cement and steel, we need emerging technologies like green hydrogen and carbon capture. Decarbonization of industry will require coordinated action from governments and from the private sector to jointly support this innovation and the scale up of these technologies that we need. Governments and regulators will play a key role in the transition. And they have a broad toolkit of stimulus measures that can support the economy and support decarbonization. And this includes both push and pull measures. The push measures would be things like regulatory changes or building codes. Pull measures are things like incentives, financial subsidies. And it will be a combination of push and pull measures that are needed to effectively drive change. Achieving the 1.5 degree pathway is a daunting challenge. But if we wait even a year or two, the math only becomes more daunting. Now is the time to act. Now is the time for bold leadership to stabilize the climate. I would now like to introduce our next two speakers. First, Michael Theban is Director General of the Department for Climate Protection at the Ministry of Economic Affairs, Innovation, Digitization, and Energy in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia. He has held various positions in the environmental administration of the state of North Rhine-Westphalia and worked as a policy officer in the Directorate General for Environment of the European Commission. We also have Dr. Christoph Sievering, who is head of energy strategy and policy at Covestro, Germany. He leads strategic positioning and advocacy in the field of energy, climate, and circular economy. In addition, Dr. Sievering is active in industrial partnerships. He has initiated a partnership program between the state government of North Rhine-Westphalia and energy intensive industries in order to develop a model towards achieving climate neutrality. Michael, Christoph, over to you. Hi, hello. Um, my name is uh, Christoph Sievering. I'm an engineer by training um, I worked in various uh, industrial sectors and uh, today I'm with uh, Covestro. And maybe just two sentences on uh, Covestro. Uh, Covestro is um, one of the leading uh, producers of high performance polymers as we speak in, in this world. And just to give you a hint, usually we, we say that you are not further away than one meter from our materials. So either um, 
you sit on it or you sleep on it. Um, if it's uh, a, a soft foam or you have it in front of you as a, as a case of, of laptops and, and these kind of things. Um, so Mike. Thank you, um, Christoph. Yes, my name is uh, Michael Thame. I'm working uh, for the Economic Ministry uh, in North Rhine-Westphalia. I'm responsible and I'm heading the department which deals with uh, uh, climate protection, but uh, under this bubble and uh, this heading climate protection are many, many different uh, topics, such as transformation of uh, our energy intensive industry or emission trading and uh, mobility questions, uh, 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 electromobility. So many uh, topics, uh, but today I'm here in my responsibility for the energy intensive industry in North Rhine Westphalia, uh, referring to uh, climate neutrality. So Michael, yes, in this sense, yeah, in, in this sense, so tell me uh, with just what you said on the topic. So what is specific about NRW, uh, North Rhine Westphalia from, from your point of view? Yes, in order to understand why we deal with this question uh, on, on the question how to transform the energy intensive industry, I think it's first of all important to understand North Rhine-Westphalia. North Rhine-Westphalia is one of the most important industrial regions in Europe and a major hub of German and European basic materials processing industry or energy intensive industry. Uh, this industry in, in, in North Westphalia provides for 1.2 million jobs and generates an annual turnover of 330 uh, billion euro. North Westphalia has around about 18 uh, million inhabitants. We have 10,000 industrial companies and we have 30% of uh, Germans greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions. Uh, we are working in our ministry uh, to on transferring this traditional uh, industry into a sustainable, which means climate neutral uh, future, thereby ensuring global competitiveness and long-term economic success, which means uh, we have um, a, a change in production and uh, you are either modernizing your industry and you are successful and you will survive or if you don't do so, you are swept away from the market. And uh, yeah, that's uh, North Australia and that's a topic we are dealing with. And um, the program that we're talking about, so uh, in for climate, uh, so how does it fit into what you expect and what you're working for? Yes, in this context, I just, in this context, I, uh, just uh, mentioned uh, uh, transform energy intensive industry. We uh, two years ago created, formed an initiative which is called In for Climate, Industry for Climate, Innovation uh, for Climate. And uh, we set up uh, this initiative, initiative that pools politics, uh, science, and, uh, and industry. And we would like to thereby to foster research on cross-sectoral uh, fields and identify solutions um, uh, in order to survive, in, in order to transform uh, our industry. And uh, 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 that means uh, we would like to, uh, to foster uh, climate protection and industrial competitiveness. And that means that we have to transform into new processes uh, in for steel industry, uh, for chemical industry, for refineries, uh, because we have all these uh, different types of industries uh, uh, which uh, produce a lot of uh, greenhouse gases and we need to transform. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this, all the uh, experience and all, all, all the things we learn, we also like to share. And uh, therefore we are proud uh, to head the under two coalitions industrial transition platform uh, where we are lead partner and to discuss our results together with the results of the other uh, European regions uh, in order to, to work together and to have uh, one and one more than two. 
Christoph, um, you are a partner in our initiative InfoClimate. What drives industry and what drives Covestro towards sustainable business and what drives you uh, to join our partnership? Mm -hmm. So when listening to a broad range of, of stakeholders and when looking at societal trends and debates, I think it has been um, very clear for many years that people want a sustainable future and that they are expecting uh, that industry and markets are acting accordingly. So um, for us, Covestro, um, this translates to uh, important imperatives, so like human rights, you no know, child labor, and these aspects of sustainability, uh, sustainable business. But um, with respect to uh, today's discussion, there are main drivers, two main drivers, and that is climate neutrality and resource neutrality, which means to envision uh, for us to become a fully circular um, as a company. And, and um, maybe what's, uh, what is your expectation? So, and why do you participate? Well, over the recent years, um, there have been quite a number of, of high level and highly sophisticated uh, studies on how to get to reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And don't get me wrong, that was all good stuff and showing options and opportunities, technologies, but quite frank, um, that was too theoretical to me and it didn't consider real life of industrial planning, scoping, permitting, uh, innovation investment recycles. And here with this program at North Rhine Westphalia, we wanted to explore how climate neutrality could be reached in a real living arena with real companies, infrastructure, real cities. So that is why we think it is a very exciting um, approach and, and we are extremely happy that it uh, could be created and, and established. Um, but Michael, let's let's reconsider. What was your expectation um, from a governmental point of view uh, when thinking about info climate? I can I can pick up what you just said. We want to, to, to be in a real arena and not just work uh, uh, on in our office and to do a theoretical work. And um, we wanted our attention was to bring all important players together in one room, uh, even in now in uh, with uh, Corona in a virtual virtual room, but normally uh, really in a room sitting together and uh, uh, discussing ideas and developing projects. So uh, um, of course we have expectations. The expectation is that industry really puts their resources uh, into this project, that they send their best people they have uh, for the topic and that they are open-minded to, to work cross-industry, cross-sectoral. Cross so, of course, industry has the, uh, 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 has the expectation that we support them with either with uh, providing uh, the, the correct framework or either giving money uh, for projects. But we yes, we, ca we can help, of course, uh, uh, as a neutral partner, but we also have the expectation that on the other side, uh, industry is open-minded, puts their resources in it, work and works together uh, with all the other industry, and also all works together uh, with uh, with the scientists we have in our project. Uh, so we do brainstormings, and we uh, we to, we we tr try to achieve more together. Mm. And. Um... What about this working together? Are you happy so far how the program is, is running and developing? Yes. Yes, we are really happy because uh, what I just said to work together uh, in, a, in, a, in a room, uh, just to give you a picture and to, to, to be guest together for a whole day, not just for, for, for a working meeting of two hours, to have workshops where we sit together, have lunch together, where we drink a coffee together and 
are able to talk to everybody, industry to industry, um, is is really a successful approach. Because I I heard so often now that uh, uh, people from industry were happy to meet people from other industries to to discuss with them possible solution and uh, 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 to create work, projects together. So it's uh, all the feedback we we received so far is going to that direction. So not only the proper work in the working groups where we uh, work on uh, special topics like uh, hydrogen, uh, carbon dioxide, power to X, uh, where do we get the heat from, how we can we create a circular economy in Northern Westphalia, all this we develop in, in workshops, but uh, uh, in between uh, uh, lunchtime or other uh, uh, occasions, uh, this is as, as worth, uh, as helpful as the, the work in the working groups uh, uh, on its own. But Christoph, what uh, would be an example for of a positive outcome for you and, and Covestro? Yeah, um, from my point of view, um, there is a very important perspective of this program. And uh, you, Michael, you has already uh, touching on it at the beginning. And this is the uh, complexity of North Rhine's failure, which means um, on uh, one hand side, uh, it will get very complicated. But on the other hand side, it provides as well many opportunities of synergies and industrial uh, symbiosis, uh, which I would like to, to, to focus on a little bit. M maybe to give an example, um, so which I hope is not getting too technical, but uh, it, I think it clarifies quite a bit. With green electricity, um, one can produce green hydrogen, which then can be used for green steel making. So that is a technology that is in focus over the recent years. That sounds great, especially as steel is one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gas emission in, in North Rhine Westphalia. But there is even more to gain. And when producing green hydrogen, there is a side product, which is green oxygen. And we can use this green oxygen to fuel a cement kiln uh, to produce cement, which is another unloved child um, in terms of greenhouse gas emission. And based on this new oxygen technology, the CO2 coming out of cement production has a much higher purity than before, and which then could be used as a feedstock for Covestro's polymer production. So. It sounds a little bit complicated, but it offers um, opportunities that we would not have working on our own just as a chemical company. Uh, we can achieve those kind of synergies only because there is a huge cluster. There's a high complexity in Northern Westphalia and that shows different ways forward. Um, but so I think that's all high hopes. It's a lot of uh, motivation, engagement. Michael, maybe um, at the end, has, do you have any recommendations for, for even improving or for, for the next uh, years to come in this program? What do you think? Well, my, my final sentence would be, uh, Info Climate proves the importance of importance uh, of continuous exchange and sharing uh, 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 of industry knowledge and scientific findings. That's one result. So we do, would do InfoClimate always uh, again. And uh, uh, I would like to add that uh, climate change is not uh, just uh, and reducing of the greenhouse gas emissions is not only a risk, it's a chance for modernization. And what is your final saying, Christoph? So I think my, my wish for the future would be um, I guess, I, I guess my wish is um, to view for climate in, in North Rhine Westphalia. There was a little bit of background noise. There was uh, to, to view this program in for climate in North Rhine Westphalia as a pilot and to extract the lessons learned and then try to apply and translate it to other regions for multiplying the industrial transformation on a global scale. Uh, Covestro. Um, have, we have huge production sites in China, in the US, 
where we find very different circumstances. Regulatory frameworks are different. So it might be difficult just to try to copy, but we need to find a way to learn from North Holland with failure and then hence um, realize maybe an even faster uh, transformation based on what we have learned in, in North Holland with failure. So that is my looking into the future. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, for me, it has been a very interesting, fantastic fireside chat. I learned something new about uh, Covestro, so I'm not. I'm, I'm only one meter away from your next product. Uh, this is uh, what I learned, and uh, yeah, I hope anybody outside there is also interested in uh, what we are doing in Northern Westphalia. No, the, the pleasure was on my side, Michael. It was it was really great, and yes, indeed, you are sitting on it right now. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, let's continue. Let's uh, let's make it a success here in Northern Westphalia. And uh, happy to meet you uh, very soon again. And uh, have a good one. Have a good weekend. Thank you, Christoph and Michael, for that great conversation. Now, we are honored to have with us Lord Barker, who is the executive chairman of the board of directors for N+. Lord Barker was previously a member of the British House of Commons from 2001 to 2015, during which time he served as the UK Minister of State for Energy and Climate Change under Prime Minister David Cameron. Thank you for joining us today, Lord Barker. My pleasure, great to be with you, Kimberly. Thanks. So perhaps to kick us off, do you wanna introduce N Plus um, and what your vision is for the low carbon aluminum industry? Sure. Well, uh, N Plus is the huge company that many people really don't know about. We are the largest producer of low carbon aluminium in the world. And we're also the world's largest generator of hydropower. Uh, we, to put that in context, we produce more clean hydropower uh, in terms of electricity than Great Britain does from all of its nuclear reactors put together. So a, we, uh, we are lucky to have this huge source, 16 gigawatts of clean energy. And the primary use of that is to smelt aluminium, the, uh, this hugely important metal for the low carbon economy. Why is it important? Well, because it has so many uh, vital green applications. It's essential for manufacturing electric vehicles and other uh, super lightweight and fuel efficient uh, tra transportation. It is essential for renewable energy. About 85% of your typical solar panel is actually uh, consisting of aluminium. It's important for uh, sustainable homes uh, because of its uh, great thermal qualities. It's used in uh, renewable infrastructure uh, and actually in the electricity industry, in many places it's replacing copper because of its connectivity. And then, of course, perhaps the, the uh, use that most people are familiar with, the uh, good old Coke can, it's used in packaging. Uh, and, you know, with so many people turning away from plastic, people are going back to aluminium. Why? N not just because it's light, uh, but because it's almost infinitely recyclable. Uh, typically, it would take about eight weeks for that Coke can, if thrown in the trash, to get back on the shelf. And something extraordinary like 75% of all the aluminium produced in the modern industrial era is still in circula cir circulation. So aluminium was going round and round in a circular economy before anyone really thought of the term. But- So Lord Barker, go ahead. Mm, sorry. What's the but? No, yeah, no, I'm, I'm the, keen the to hear the but. Um, is that uh, not all aluminium um, is yeah. made the same That's way. So right. while we are made with uh, clean energy, and it's very, very energy intensive to make this stuff. The majority of the world's aluminium, particularly that coming from China, is actually produced with coal-fired ele electricity. And as a result, the carbon footprint of what appears to be exactly the same metal is actually radically different. So for the N plus group, the carbon footprint of our metal is about two and a half tons of carbon to make one ton of aluminium. Whereas coming from China, where it's coal-fired electricity, 
it's 16 and a half tons of carbon to make just one ton of aluminium. So 16 and a half versus two and a half. That's a huge difference. So we are really trying to raise awareness that this is a really vital metal for the low carbon economy, but we've got to create it, manufacture it in a res climate responsible way. And what's more, we've got to drive down the uh, the emissions even further. So while two and a half tons is way better than 16 and a half tons, um, ultimately we've got to get to net zero and play our part as an industry in creating a zero emission economy. So, so Lord Barker, thank you. That's very helpful to understand. If we think about the rest of the industry that is typically higher carbon and maybe doesn't have access to the same hydropower um, resources that, that N plus does, what's the answer for them? Is it carbon capture mm -hmm. or is it transitioning the whole industry to sources of hydropower? You know, what do you think is the long-term way to get the industry to zero carbon? Well, ultimately, if you can't wean your industry off coal or wean your business off coal, there is no long-term future. Um, I think we have to be clear that coal as an unabated coal, as an energy source, doesn't have a long-term future in a world that wants to take action on climate change. And that's hard, that's, you know, that's hard, hard news for many big aluminium smelting business, uh, companies. But it, you know, there are alternatives. Um, the whole energy system, if we are to defeat uh, climate change, if we are to meet the Paris goals, it's, this isn't something that's unique to the aluminium sector, all industry, um, all economies need to get off coal, ditch coal, dump coal, and go towards a grid which is based on renewables and other clean sources of energy. Of course, if carbon capture can be made commercial, then that has a role as well. But whether it's whether it's nuclear, whether it's hydro, wind, solar, um, whatever your clean energy of choice, um, it, it has to be a low emitting source of electricity that you use to create aluminium, particularly on the scale that the world needs it on. Need it, needs it on. And then you've got to address the technologies that actually re reduce the emissions associated with the manufacture itself of the, of the product, which we're working on as well. Can you share more about that? Because you mentioned even with hydropower, there's still greenhouse gas emissions and those would still need Abs to get to net zero. Absolutely. What's, I mean, we're a global company. So our aluminium starts life in West Africa or in Jamaica in bauxite mines, and it's then shipped to refineries. We um, own Europe's largest uh, refinery of bauxite in Ireland, where it's turned into alumina. And then it has to be shipped to somewhere where there's a plentiful source of electricity, in our case, Lake Baikal in Siberia, where it's turned into aluminium. Now, the actual smelting process still exudes carbon dioxide. We're working on a radical new technology, which called inert anodes, which would actually exude oxygen rather than carbon dioxide as a, as a byproduct of the smelting process. So that's really exciting. Um, we haven't yet got it to a level where it can be commercially uh, expanded, but, but we think that is in within our reach. Uh, and we're very excited of the developments that we can see this, this decade of changing the actual basis of the way that we smelt. And then, of course, you've got the emissions associated with mining, with, um, with uh, refining and transport. But again, this is about squeezing out coal and ensuring that the electricity and energy used in those processes comes from a clean source. So, you know, it, it does seem that whatever the question is, it all comes back to if you can green the energy system, then actually you're a long way down the road to producing a low carbon economy. And what are the what are the ways to make that happen? I mean, I can imagine a lot of different things. You know, one is clearly policy and having policy requirements around emissions and energy sourcing. You know, another could be the end demand markets. And are, if customers are demanding low carbon products and they want their supply chains to be low carbon, um, or if there's some sort of a price premium for low carbon commodities. What are the mechanisms in practice to move the entire industry? Well, I'm a great believer in try everything. Um, there is inherent market failure in the climate change agenda. We can't just allow 
the private sector to get there in its own good time, despite the fact that there is an incredible innovation happening across the private sector now. We do need responsible governments to step up with a really robust policy framework to drive progress faster and in a clearer direction in order to ensure that we meet the science-based targets that are implicit in the Paris Agreement and hopefully which will be fleshed out at COP26 in Glasgow next year. So I think there's certainly a, a role for policy at national government level and, uh, and regional government level. Um, but the private sector and indeed the consumer have got a role to play as well. I mean, if you look at the way in which investors and consumers have tilted away from the fossil fuel industry and the massive impact that that's had, um, you know, with the reverberations that go way beyond just the oil companies themselves, that's a real sign of the power of consumers and of um, investors. And I think just as that's happened to the oil and gas sector, I think uh, the seven big in, uh, industrial sectors, you know, or not just oil and gas, but you know, uh, steel, um, chemicals, um, uh, aluminium, of course, um, the other big emitting industries also have to transition to a low, low emission pathway. We are trying to lead that with a combination of industry initiatives and also calling for more proactive support from, from governments around the world. One idea, clean label, you know, better labeling. It seems very basic and many people are surprised it's not happening already. But what we want to see, and we're calling on the London Metal Exchange to enact, is clear carbon content labeling on all the trades on the London Metal Exchange in aluminium so that consumers can actually see what it is uh, that they're buying. And we think that needs to be made mandatory. And I think some of the big users of aluminium, like the, the automotive manufacturers, particularly the electric car manufacturers, you know, they've issued their own targets. So they need to get much smarter about procurement um, and look at what the carbon content is of the metal, the metal products that they're buying. And can those companies trace that already? Or is that something that we need to put in place the mechanisms to create that transparency? Well, it's beginning. There's good progress being made out there. And I think, you know, post pandemic, there's going to be an even greater push to drive the climate agenda. Uh, but we need to step up. We, you know, so for example, as I, as I mentioned, we're calling on the London Metal Exchange to um, introduce mandatory carbon reporting. And I think and we need to put in place a number of the reporting and disclosure measures that, have, that are already in the pipeline, but rather than you know, wait to do them over a number of years through the 2020s. We've just got to step up and get on with these things now. Grasp the nettle yeah. and not make the perfect um, the enemy of the good. I'm a, I'm a great believer that, you know, start carbon reporting it can be on a voluntary basis to begin with. Um, it doesn't need to be overly onerous. And then we can iterate it over time. We can work on it, improve it, improve it, see what the market wants to wants to know. Um, make it simple um, and just get going is, is always my uh, my great adage. That's probably the right attitude given the urgency of climate change. Um, everybody talks about net zero by 2050, but the reality is that for the Paris Agreement, for a 1.5 degree pathway, it's the next decade that's most critical. We would have to be reducing emissions by at least 50% in the next decade. Do you think that's plausible uh, for the aluminum sector and for other industrial sectors? Um, yes, I do. I mean, if you look at the progress that's already been made, I was um, party to creating the Climate Change Act in Great Britain that we passed in 2008. And uh, since um, that passed, you know, there's been a real focus on driving down emissions through transforming the energy sector, obviously taking a much of the low hanging fruit. But Great Britain is now something like 46% down its peak emissions from uh, 1992. So 46%, um, that's not quite 50, but it's well on the way um, to that net zero target. So it can be done. We don't have to be um, you know, pessimistic about our ability to meet this if we really um, have the will to do it. But there are a number of steps that each individual industry have to take that won't always be comfortable. And the reality is, however much we innovate and we need to innovate more, 
whatever the technology we invest in, there will be winners and losers in every industry. Um, there will be a shakeout. This isn't a uh, path without any pain at all, but I do believe it's also a path with huge opportunities, particularly for the first movers and those who are able to transition sooner rather than later to a low carbon model of growth. Fantastic. Um, you mentioned technology, and I just wanted to ask you one final question about this innovation that, that N plus is pursuing on smelting. I always get a bit worried when people talk about new technologies and it, just in the timeline of will this happen on the timeline we need to address climate change? Um, because we don't have 20, 30 years. We, we really need to act quickly. Are you optimistic that the technology innovation can be fast enough uh, to be scaled on the timeline we need? Yes, on balance, I, I am optimistic, but I don't underestimate the hurdles ahead. I don't underestimate that there will be pushback. And I think we have to expect that there will be you know, difficulties on the way, particularly as we, the more we drive down emissions, the harder it's going to get towards that ultimate net zero goal. But I would expect the aluminium, aluminium industry to look very different indeed by the time we get to 2035. Um, whether we'll be absolutely bang on the target that we need to reach, I you know, can't say at this point in time, but we are heading in direction, the right direction. And I do see increasing awareness in what historically has been quite a conservative industry, um, that increasing awareness that now is the time to act and people are, are focusing on those ESG metrics that are going to drive change in the near term, as well as setting much longer term goals. Wonderful. That is great to hear. Thank you for joining us today, Lord Barker, and thank you for everything you've done on climate change, both in your current role and your previous roles. Um, Thanks. Need, Have a need great week. Like You've got a huge right agenda ahead, ahead of you this week at uh, Climate Week. I'm going to be tuning in with great interest. Thank you. I would like to introduce our next two speakers who are joining us for a discussion on industry partnerships. Michel Bruhlhardt is the executive director of the Coppermark and works on the design, implementation, and independent assessment of sustainability standards. Michelle has evaluated and assisted companies at every level of the supply chain, from raw materials to end products and across multiple materials. Also joining us is Matthew Wenben smith from Responsible Steel, a global membership organization with a mission to maximize steel's contribution to a sustainable society. Responsible Steel addresses the key social and environmental impacts of steelmaking, including the trillion dollar challenge of transitioning to net zero greenhouse gas emissions in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So Matthew, let's start with you. Can you give us an introduction to Responsible Steel and your ambition for the industry? I'm um, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Kimberly. Well, you, you've nailed it in your in, initial introduction. We're a, we're a global multi-stakeholder, not-for-profit organization. As you said, our mission is to maximize steel's contribution to a sustainable society. Um, there are four parts to that mission. Um, responsible sourcing of the raw materials used for steel making, um, responsible production and processing of steel, um, steel use, and recycling of steel, those four pieces. Um, the tools we have um, are fairly traditional standards and certification. Um, and our ambition is about as ambitious as it can get um, we would like to see the whole industry worldwide using our standards or equivalent, and that's important, um, in line with our, in line with our, our mission. Now, that's a long term, a long term vision and mission, but that's what we would like to achieve. Fantastic. Thank you, Matthew. Michelle, how about you? Could you share the sustainability goals for Coppermark? Sure, happy to. Um, so the Copper Mark is, is a younger organization, um, but our foundation and inspiration is the UN SDGs, and particularly our vision is linked to UN SDG 12 and responsible production and responsible consumption. So as um, similar to Matthew's toolbox, we are also an assurance framework, um, specifically though designed to help the copper industry demonstrate responsible production practices and demonstrate their contribution to the UN SDGs. Um, so that is where we are hoping to go. 
Um, likewise, our mission, mission and vision is really to move the bulk of the copper industry. So in a similar way, we are hoping to see the vast majority of the copper industry over time to adhere to those responsible production practices, to improve their practices over time, um, and to, as we said, be able to demonstrate and communicate how they do so and what their responsible actions are at the end of the day to their stakeholders, be that their customers or their investors or other stakeholder communities that have an interest in these topics. Now, these are clearly very challenging topics for the industries that you work in. I mean, I know with steel, um, my area is greenhouse gas emissions, and I know it's a very, a very difficult challenge for that industry. And then if, if we talk about copper, you've got the whole ESG landscape to think about. You know, what do you see as the main barriers to achieving the vision of your organizations? And, and what change do we need to see to achieve these goals? Um, well, maybe Michelle, if I can start can kick off that. I think the, the biggest barrier is, is, is timing, really. I think the steel sector, in, if we're talking about greenhouse gases, they know the challenge. They know where we need to get to, um, as you said, to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions for the sector. And currently it's around 7 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions from industry. So it's a, it's a huge challenge. Um, the, and when I say timing, the, it's, it's urgent. It's really urgent to achieve that. But it requires investment. It requires trillions of dollars of investment um, over that time period. And we have to start. When we talk to businesses, I think there are two kinds of conversations we have. Some of those conversations are about steel. Well, can you tell us um, what your market share is? Um, how much, um, how much, what, what's the size of the supply of responsible steel, certified steel today? And they're asking those kinds of questions. Or on the um, um, supply side, you know, can you tell us what the size of the demand is? The other kinds of conversations we have are around the theory of change. How long will it take? What's the transition pathway? Um, what are the milestones? And those kinds of conversations are much more productive. It's setting out the goal and then working backwards from that goal, what do we have to do to get there? Lots of things have to fall into place. We need finance and there needs to be um, a supportive policy environment. Yes, there does need to be demand and yes, there does need to be supply and these things need to happen together. But the fundamental challenge is finding the businesses that will make that commitment so that we can solve this chicken and egg problem and start to move forwards. Maybe to build on that, Kimberly, if I may, I, I think those those are some, some really great points, um, Matthew, of course, and you've touched upon the, the ESG landscape for copper in general. And so indeed, you know, for the copper mark, um, similar to, to other initiatives, we have a comprehensive approach. Um, and that's really to understand that there are clearly very urgent and pressing challenges around climate risk and climate change and how do we what is the contribution we can do as a copper mark um, or indeed the copper industry in this regard and so that is one area that we address um, through requirements related to greenhouse gas emission targets um, reduction reduction of energy use and increased use of energy of renewable energy um, at the same time it is a more comprehensive landscape. And when we say responsible production, we're really looking at social issues, governance issues, um, environmental issues, more broadly speaking, um, where different interventions may be needed, um, different action may be needed to ensure responsible practices. Um, I, I think Matthew would absolutely agree with the statement that you know it's, it's a path, it's a long-term goal that requires a broad set of stakeholders to all play their role, um, to I think increasingly collaborate to achieve those objectives. You know, we've mentioned equivalency or recognizing other systems. We're not operating in a vacuum, right? We're operating with other stakeholders and with other commodities. Um, we're part of supply chains where multiple commodities end up in the same product. And so really how do we create these effective collaborations and partnerships across industries, up and down the supply chain, to really drive the impact um, that we're looking for. 
And then one other thing I would mention in terms of barriers is just the challenge of really moving that bulk of the industry. Right? I think what we're seeing is a, a set of leading um, actors and organizations that are deeply committed to making this change happen and are at the forefront of organizations and initiatives and, and are very actively involved. And, and we really you know, welcome that and, and support that. Um, it also means that we have large parts of the supply chain and the industry that are not necessarily part of these conversations yet, um, where there are significant knowledge gaps, significant capacity gaps in terms of understanding what the expectations are and how they can reach those expectations. Um, and I, I think there's a lot more work for us to be done, again, to the extent that collective efforts can support that, um, to help raise the bar um, across the whole industry and really bring the rest of the field along as well. Michelle, that's, that's a great ambition. I think raising the bar is what we need to see in pretty much every industry these days. Um, I like your point about collaboration, because when we talk about sustainability challenges, we find so many of them are systemic and a, a single company can't address it alone. And you need collaboration across the industry, often across the value chain with the public sector, the private sector. I mean, I'd love if you could each speak to your respective industry and the role of collaboration. What does collaboration enable and unlock you know, for the industry to, to address these challenges? I think that's such a great question. There are so many sort of levels of collaboration and, and um, Michelle was referring to some of them. I and mean, copper and steel are not necessarily industries that you see as overlapping, and yet there are overlaps um, and ways of achieving interoperability. So that's a really important area of collaboration. But I would say that the whole, the responsible steel model is, is founded on collaboration and cooperation um, and let me just give you maybe two dimensions of that. One dimension is between business and civil society. I mentioned we're, we're multi-stakeholder, and that's the fundamental, I suppose, balance of, balance of power, if you like, in the organization. So we have businesses and we have civil society organizations, and they, their, their role in governance is equal. They have equal power on our board, equal voting power in our membership. It's the, it's the companies which are doing, if you like, the, the heavy lifting, but it's the civil society which is giving them the support and giving the responsible steel a model, the, the credibility it needs to, to really bite, to really um, convince people that this is the right way to go, to validate the model. And one of the really attractive things from working in this kind of organization is, is that cooperation between businesses and civil society. And then with the, within the businesses, looking up and down supply chains. So within Responsible Steel, um, we have um, two of the largest um, mining companies, um, Anglo-American and BHP. We now have five steel makers, including um, ArcelorMittal, BlueScope, um, Aparam, Otokumpu, Vastalpina, um, BMW and Daimler, and Lendlease on the demand side, um, HSB from the finance sector. It's not, that's not all the companies in the world. We would like more, but we've, we, we've got a posse um, and I think a few more will have critical mass and working together up and down the supply chains, across supply chains, between business and civil society. I think we really stand a chance of achieving um, that ambitious objective. It's going to be hard to add on any of that <laughs> in terms of Matthew's points. I mean, completely agree on, on the complementarity. We've, we've touched upon that. I, I think Again, we have to recognize the massive amount of work that's already happened in this space. Um, and, you know, there's so much learnings we can take from each other um, and really no need for us to, to, to rebuild things that already exist. Um, you know, Matthew mentioned the multi-stakeholder approach. That is something really interesting in our case because the copper mark is, in, is originally um, an initiative of the copper industry. It was founded and, and the concept was originally developed by the copper industry. Um, but there was exactly that recognition that in order for this to become successful, it needs to broaden the collaborations across sectors along the value chain and with different stakeholders. So we're on a path to transition to a full multi-stakeholder organization. Um, this year, we have set up our multi-stakeholder advisory council um, we have added more representation from non-industry into our decision-making and will continue to do so. Um, and so again, very much echoed that value of just having different perspectives um, 
it, it helps understand where the pain points are at each level and, and amongst each stakeholder group. And that ultimately helps you to make sure the response of the industry really addresses those pain points and drives the conversation forward. I, I would say just a last element to add to collaboration to me is the value of working really with organizations on the ground that have innovative approaches to engaging with communities, for example. Um, there is so much new technology that's emerging, um, looking at ways, for example, to provide transparency in supply chains, to share data, um, whether that's on, on carbon footprint or whether that's on origin or provenance of materials. Um, and so I think there's there's a big opportunity as well just to, again, learn from other systems outside of the value chain and outside of that bubble that that we all, to some extent, have around us um, and, and where possible, almost leapfrog and find new solutions that can help us drive impact. And maybe I Michelle, could just... Michelle, I feel like you're picking up. Go ahead, Matthew. No. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Kimberly. I was going to say, Michelle and I have been working together in this area in different different roles in mining. And now Michelle is with Copper and, and I'm with um, Responsible Steel. And there is a lot of collaboration between, between different uh, metals, between mining and the metal sector, um, a very healthy and I, and I find enjoyable exchanging of ideas. But um, Michelle, I was going to say, why don't we, for the next question, let you, let you go first, <laughs> give you a chance to get- get so you can get add on to my thoughts. In, indeed. <laughs> Well, this is actually a great segue to what from what you were just discussing, which is collaboration across sectors and sharing lessons learned. I'm conscious that most of our viewers, you know, are probably not from the steel or copper sector and probably not from the metals and mining sector even. I'd love to hear what you think is a lesson that you've learned that could be helpful for these other sectors or an achievement, you know, that you've seen in your collaborations that could be replicated more broadly. So if, if you have ideas, I'm sure our viewers would love to hear it. Michelle, do you want to start? Now, now the tough question starts with me. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, Matthew alluded to that, that really dynamic exchange and, and I would say with a high level of collaboration, even though we, we could always do more, um, that exists. I, I think there's a lot of interlinkage in the mineral metal space around voluntary standard systems. And again, a very active um, exchange on how can we do better, you know, what, what works in our systems, what doesn't, what learnings can we take from other um, sectors that may have run these schemes for a longer period of time. And I'm thinking they're particularly around how do we understand the impact that we have on the ground? How do we measure that impact? Um, so, so I think there's a willingness in the minerals and metals space to really learn from existing experience. There's a willingness to build on each other's work and, and to complement our efforts um, and to really try and understand, you know, where, where are those gaps? Um, where do we need to fill the gaps that, that we haven't yet addressed? So I, I personally find that very enjoyable in, in this space to work with. Um, and, and then again, I think it's it's really interesting because to some extent, many um, mineral producers have a lot of experience in ESG topics um, and have been working on these for a long time. And I think one of the challenges has really been how to communicate that upwards in their supply chain, how to make your customers, your investors really understand what it is that you're doing. Um, on site, and then again, sort of trying to see what is the role of frameworks to help with that communication, um, to just facilitate the exchange of information. Again, we're coming back to multi-stakeholder approaches and collaboration, but a lot of it is not so much even in, in sort of um, setting expectations or requirements as it is about communicating and understanding what the practices are, having an engagement and, and understanding better your counterpart at the very end of your supply chain um, and where really the raw materials in your products are coming from. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I'd start off maybe by saying that, that we, we, we and neither of us, Responsible Steel nor, nor Coppermark, Clay, would claim to have invented this model. Um, we're building on models from, from other sectors um, that preceded us. Um, this multi-stakeholder model is fairly well established in, in several commodities, in, in timber, um, marine, in agriculture, um, soy, palm oil. It's quite a, 
the, the model or, or flavors of the model are quite widely established. And certainly we have been trying to learn from our predecessors. So we, we can't claim to have invented this. Um, one thing I, and I really echo Michelle, one thing I find really um, enjoyable about working in the mining and mineral sector is this willingness to collaborate, this sense that there is a, there is a, shared, a shared sense of purpose and that allows us to share things. Certainly at Responsible Steel, we, we encourage everybody to beg, borrow or steal anything we're using um, that will help them in, in their mission. Um, partly because we think that will help us achieve our mission. And just to give you an example, we, our, um, our ambition extends from mine right through to end product. But we are not in the business of certifying mining. There are other schemes out there that evaluate, have standards for responsible mining. We see our role as ev evaluating them to make sure they meet our scale of ambition, um, our, our objectives, our quality concerns, and then actually being the market for them. So we collaborate very closely with, um, with the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, with um, Towards Sustainable Mining, the Programme of Mining Association Canada, Better Coal, and open to collaborating with other mining initiatives. We don't need to reinvent that wheel. We, the future, I think, for, certainly for the mineral mining and metal sector, will be increasing levels of cooperation, collaboration. It doesn't necessarily mean merger. And one of the, the um, analogies I use, it's a little like different models of cars, but underneath the bonnet, we will see shared chassis, um, shared, shared parts and interoperability there. And I think that way we will, we will be working together to achieve um, our shared ambition. So for example, um, the goals of the, of the Paris Agreement, we're all working towards that. So let's try and collaborate to achieve that better and faster. Matthew, that's um, thank you for that. That's that's very helpful and very inspiring. I'm going to pick on your car analogy just for a minute um, because we we actually hear a lot from the automotive industry these days about decarbonization, and I think the automotive industry and many others are thinking about their supply chains and how do they effectively engage with the supply chain to address these challenges. Michelle spoke to that uh, a little bit in respect to copper, but any any thoughts in steel? How the Kind of the farther end of the, the the value chain can engage. You know, how can these companies that use steel engage with the industry on this? Well, well, I mentioned that, that BMW and Daimler um, are our members, and, and certainly the building sector has analogous analogous challenges. Some of the early conversations um, we had with car makers was what they refer to as the periodic table challenge. That steel is a very major component of cars. Um, and will remain so with the with the um, electric revolution. Um, but it's not the only component that car makers who are asking questions about their supply chains and um, care about. There's a list of 20 or 30 um, mater major materials that they also care about. So this question of interoperability, I think, is, is critical. Um, from where they are standing, they would like to have, if you like, a single framework into which potentially a range of other schemes could fit. That's certainly um, how, how we would see it. And the more you know, we have conversations with, with Michelle, with others, the more, if you like, there is a shared framework that then the car makers can use across commodities, um, the, the better, I think. Um, maybe I also could just mention a collaboration that we have with, um, with the climate group, Steel Zero, which will be launched, being launched in November. And, and that has, we've, um, we're establishing collaborations with a number of car makers, a working group on car makers, a working group on business and construction to actually help solve these problems together. What will make it easier for car makers to specify, um, from our point of view, responsible steel, how to specify that. But from their point of view also, they're thinking about, well, how does that fit with their other needs for specifying um, other, other, um, in, in relation to other materials? Perfect. Well, thank you both. Um, it was great to hear about what you're doing in your industries. It's very inspiring. So thank you for all your efforts to make the metals industries more sustainable. And thank you for sharing your lessons for our viewers, who I'm sure will take away a lot from this discussion. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. So to wrap up our discussion on industrial sectors, I wanted to share a few closing remarks, um, summarizing some of the takeaways from the wonderful discussion we've had. 
And we've benefited from insights from across a number of industries, from representatives of the copper industry, steel, aluminum, and polymers. And the things that I've taken away are, you know, first of all, this is hard, of course, to decarbonize these industrial sectors, but it is doable. And we should be optimistic that we can get there. And to get there, there's a number of things that each industry and each company in each industry should be pursuing. So one is establishing partnerships to work across the value chain, work with civil society, work with the supply chain, work with policymakers um, to enable the systemic change that we need. Because in many of these sectors, companies can't achieve it alone. We have to do this in partnership. Another is establishing new standards and new labeling to create transparency around carbon emissions. So people can understand the carbon emissions generated upstream you know, from metals and from industrial sectors. And then that can help reinforce the markets needed to transition to low carbon, low carbon commodities. A third is finding win-wins in the circular economy and climate change. Because the circular economy is all about creating efficiency and substituting materials from materials that could be lower emissions or could be reusable or recyclable. And that will help us reduce emissions across many industrial sectors. Another thing that every company should be doing is setting milestones, You're thinking about what are the goals that are science-based in line with what we need to achieve on emissions globally, and then work backwards from there. Of, okay, now given these science-based goals, how do we achieve them? What technically needs to be done in the next years to get there? And then finally, conscious that you know, companies aren't able to do this entirely on their own, they need to work with policymakers to set up the right regulatory framework, to set up the right incentives, to be able to adopt these new technologies and make these investments to decarbonize these sectors. So there is a lot to be done, um, but it sounds like we know what to do. And now it's just a matter of bold leadership to get there so we can stabilize the climate.